So this is the probability that under the null hypothesis, the t distribution takes a value greater than 8.504. Similarly, you can think of minus 8.504 because it's a two-tailed test. So this is the probability that under the null hypothesis, a t distribution will take a value less than minus 8.504. So the probability that under the null hypothesis, given the null hypothesis is true, you will find a t value either greater than 8.504 or less than minus 8.504 is this area plus this area. That is the maximum probability of finding a t value less than minus 8.504 or greater than plus 8.504, plus 8 which is the probability with which you will go wrong if you reject the null hypothesis that alpha hat is equal to 0, which is the maximum probability of going wrong if you reject the null hypothesis, right, at that p value, t value. This value, this area, this area plus this area is called the p value, p value, right. And what does this say? It says that the p value is very, very small, 2 e raised to minus 16, so 0 0.0000000 etc. up to 5 points, right, okay, e raised to minus 16. So we say that we can safely reject the null hypothesis here that alpha is equal to 0. We will then say that alpha hat is statistically significantly different from 0. What can you say about the coefficient of income? How will you interpret the coefficient of income? What does the coefficient of income first say and how do you interpret that? What do you say? It says that as labor income goes up, non-labor income goes up, the probability of participation goes down. Why? How would you, as micro, microeconomists, how would you understand this? You would say that leisure is a normal good. You would say that leisure is a normal good. So as you become wealthier, you spend, you work, you consume more leisure. So you work less, right? Sure? Okay. So that coefficient is negative. Now what do you think about the statistical significance of that coefficient? What would be the probability of going wrong? If I rejected the null, what is the maximum probability of going wrong? If I rejected the null, that the coefficient of income was equal to 0. It's very small. 4.08 e raised to 0.5, e raised to minus 5. So 0 0.00004, so very small. So you can reject the null hypothesis that the coefficient of income is equal to 0. What do you think about age? As you become older, you are less likely to work. Is that coefficient statistically significantly different from zero? Yes. yes. What do you think about education? If you reject the null, there is a 23 percent chance of being wrong, right? So which seems to be a high chance of being wrong, one in more than one in five. And therefore, you will not, it will be risky to reject the null that the coefficient of education equals zero. And therefore, at least on the face of this data, we do not have evidence to say that education matters for labor force participation. And you could see that from the picture. What do you think about young kids? The number of young kids, if you have more young kids, are you less likely to work or more likely to work? Less likely. Less likely. And is that coefficient statistically significant? Yes. But what about old kids? Not significant. So it doesn't really matter whether how many old kids you have. Right? What about foreign? Yes. So if you are a foreigner, is the coefficient of the dummy variable. So it says given everything the same, so if you take a foreigner, okay, so if you take all foreigners and all Swiss people who are identical in all other respects here, that is they have the same income, they have the same age, they have the same education, same number of young kids, they have the same number of eight, uh, old kids. Then it says that the percentage of foreigners who are working will be 28 percent more than the percentage of the Swiss people who are working, right? Because we know that the dummy variable essentially is yi is equal to alpha plus beta di plus ei, di is 1. So conditional mean of yi given di is equal to 1 is alpha plus beta. Conditional mean of yi given di is equal to 0 is alpha. So what is beta? Beta actually compares the mean of y when d is equal to 1 to the mean of y when d is equal to 0. 
beta tells you how much higher or lower it is related to alpha, right? So here we have when foreign yes, it says a if you take a foreigner, if you take a group of foreigners who are identical to the Swiss in all other respects, because the condition it ultimately what you're looking for, you're looking for a conditional mean of y, conditional upon income, age, education, young kids, old kids, and whether foreign is equal to one or not. So if you put foreign is equal to 1 or foreign is equal to 0, all other conditions remain the same. So it says if you take a group of Swiss people and a group of non-foreigners in Switzerland, both of whom are identical in all other respects, they have the same income, same age, same education, same young kids, same old kids, then foreigners are about 0.28 percent more likely to work compared to non-foreigners. Yeah? Is this clear? And is that statistically significant? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, what does the residual standard error tell you? It tells you sigma hat square ka square root. Estimated variance of the error term is summation e hat i square upon n minus k uska square root is the estimated standard error. What is the r square? r square is 0.15, not too good. And ultimately, finally, the f statistic is testing whether all these coefficients are significantly different from 0 as a group. So the restricted model is y i regressed only on intercept, which is the conditional mean of y is constant. And the other is all these variables. And we say that the difference between these two models is significant, because the f value is pretty large and the p value associated is pretty small. Right? Is this clear? Okay. Yeah. See, what we do, we have the unconstrained, unrestricted model, the restricted model. The restricted model would be where income, age, education, young kids, old kids, foreign, yes, all these coefficients are equal to 0. Right? So yi simply is equal to alpha plus ei. So the condition mean of yi is constant, alpha, doesn't depend upon any other variables. And each individual value of this is alpha plus some gap, which is ei. That is the restricted model. The unrestricted model is this full model. And we are trying to see whether the residual sum of squares of the restricted model minus the unrestricted model, that formula which we did in the first semester, right, whether there is a significant difference between the two models. The null is that they are not significantly different. The p value there is pretty small. You see a large f, okay? And therefore, we can safely reject the null that the two models are identical, which means that all these coefficients as a group are not equal to 0, right? Okay, now here, what are the marginal effects of income? You can see that DABA participation by DABA income is minus 0 0.16. Yeah? Minus 0 0.1679, I rounded off to minus 0 0.168. Okay? If you look at now the y hats, if you look at y hats, you see a problem. You see a problem, you see that actually, only a small amount of y hats are less than 1. The median value of y hat is between say 1.2 to 1.6, which is a problem because y is a variable coded between 0 and 1. So y hats cannot be greater than 1 substantially. So there is a problem with this. Okay? There is a problem with this. Okay? Histogram of the fitted model and the fitted values of the LPM. So that is a standard and therefore the linear probability model is not really acceptable to us because it will generate probabilities which are greater than 1, which are nonsensical. Right? Sure? You know, obvious, no? because if intercept is something, if a person has a specific income or specific, if you put these values, there is no guarantee that the value of y will be less than 1. It can be any value. Right? So therefore, that, that's be the basic problem. So now we have the. We can't scale down the values to one. How will you? You can't. Okay. The logistic regression model, right? Therefore, we have the logistic regression model. So we have seen in the last class so far that the logistic regression model actually solves the problem of log of p upon one minus p is alpha plus beta x plus e. Okay, where? p upon 1 minus p is the odds ratio. So, instead of writing y is equal to alpha plus beta x i plus e, we write 
the natural log of the odds ratio as a linear function of alpha plus beta x plus e, right? Sure? But that is not the reason why it is called the logic model, okay? So, p is the probability the event occurs, y occurs, probability y is equal to 1, we know that, right? And that is why this ratio is called the log odds ratio, that is why it is called the log odds ratio. This is the odds ratio and the natural log of that, yeah? This is not really a good reason, but it is called a logic model, but let us, okay, so more. Now, you see, this is the important idea. The estimated probability is p is equal to 1 upon 1 plus e raised to minus alpha minus beta x, right? So, basically as alpha plus beta x gets really big, p approaches 1. As alpha plus beta x gets really small, p approaches 0. So, you get something like this, okay? As x becomes larger, probability that y is equal to 1 approaches 1. So, it will always be bounded between 0 and 1. Whereas, the linear probability model can be anything. It can exceed the bounds of 0 and 1. That is why we do not use it, okay? Now, let us think of a simple probit model. See, the crit critical idea, friends, is the critical idea here is, can I have the duster? Here we have duster. Sid, did you throw it away? No. So, basically what we want is, basically what we want is, probability y i is equal to 1 is some function of x i beta with the property that this function is bounded between 0 and 1, okay? Right. So, if you use the logistic PDF, okay, if you if think of x as the logistic PDF, okay, right, then you get the logistic regression. Whereas, there is a little bit of a mistake here, whereas if, if f of x is a standard normal CDF, it should be the standard normal CDF really, it gives the probit model, okay, right? For the linear probability model, you have pi, pi is equal to x i beta, pi is equal to x i beta is a standard linear probability model, right? Whereas for the logistic regression, you have in general probability i, okay, that is probability y i takes the value 1 conditional upon x is f of x i dash beta right f of x i dash beta okay is it ha huh. cdf of the standard normal it is the cdf of the standard normal it gives the probit model yeah, the cdf will be bounded between 0 and 1 okay the cdf is continuous no? Which function? See, the probability, what are we saying is, we want the probability that y is equal to 1 is a continuous function of x i beta, right? 1, 0 is not, but the probability y is equal to 1 is, right? Okay? Fine. So, so basically, basically, if you look at this carefully, how do we derive this likelihood function for a general outcome? If probability y is equal to 1 is f of x i beta, probability y i is equal to 0 is 1 minus f of x i dash beta, right? So, if you have a observed sample, say 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, right? This is, this is f of x i beta, this is 1 minus f of x i beta. So, the joint probability of observing this is the product of the individual probabilities, right? which is 4 times 1, which is summation y i, because this is, this is all y is, right? This is y 1, this is y 2, y 3, y 4, y 5, y 6, y 7, y 8, y 9, okay? Right? So, what will summation y i be? 4, right? But what is 4? 4 is, it will have to be f of x i dash beta raised to 4, 1 minus f of 
x i dash beta 1 minus 4, right? Sorry, n minus 4, n minus 4, right? Sure? In general, what is 4? Summation y i. So, this will have to be summation y i, n minus summation y i. And if you take the natural log of this, then this will become y i log f, right? And this will, this, this will, so, so it will become, it will become summation y i log f of x i dash beta plus n minus summation y i log of 1 minus f, yeah? If you take the, because we just got one sample, no? See, in the binomial, when does NCX come? NCX, you are asking the question, in how many ways can you get 4 1s and 7 zeros? But here you just have one of them. Therefore, the NCX part does not come. Okay? So, summation y i log, right? So, is this clear? So, yeah. that is a like the function, right? The summation y i will Right. Yeah. Or, if you take the summation out of the bracket, if you take the summation out and write this whole thing like this, then this will have to be 1. You see the point? Yeah? If you, if you, if you take the summation outside, then it will be summation y i log f of x dash f of x dash beta plus 1 minus y i log, right? Now, the MLE that it yields, you will have to differentiate that with respect to beta and it will yield you this MLE. Right? Now, this is something quite similar, you know. Okay, this is f dash of x i dash beta into x i. If you look at this, if, if what is y i? This is y i minus f of x dash beta. This is some form of the error term e i. So, again you have the condition e i x i is equal to 0, but a slightly more put in a slightly different format, right? So, this is the condition that you get if you differentiate with respect to beta and solve, you will get the maximum likelihood estimates. Yeah, so the point then is the ML is consistent if the conditional density is correctly specified. If the conditional density is logistic, the ML is consistent as all of us know the proof, right? If the density is correctly specified, then you see that the derivative of 